Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2020 awarding of the George W. Hunt S.J. Prize for Excellence in Journalism, Arts, and Letters. I'm Father Ryan Lerner, and I'm the chaplain of St. Thomas More, the Catholic Chapel and Center at Yale University. Since 2015, St. Thomas More and America have partnered in recognizing and celebrating the work of a new generation of writers. Past award recipients of the Hunt Prize include poets, journalists, novelists, and cultural and historical critics, and their work continues to enrich our society and culture to this day. I became the eighth Catholic chaplain at Yale University in March of 2019 after the long and distinguished tenure of my predecessor, Father Robert L. Boulogne, who died in September of 2018 after a courageous battle with brain cancer. Father Bob, to all who knew him, was a driving and dynamic force at St. Thomas More and in the Yale and New Haven communities. Father Bob recognized the value in fostering future generations of Catholic thought and public intellectualism. His spirit and commitment to excellence remain an inspiration and continues to inform our work at St. Thomas More. It is in this spirit of celebration that we are so pleased to be here to announce this year's Hunt Prize winner. As we move ahead, we're working with our colleagues at America to further our shared objective of encouraging the very best young writers in the Catholic tradition. We look forward to continuing the legacy and ideals espoused by both Father Boulogne and Father Hunt. It is now my pleasure to welcome Father Matt Malone to introduce the 2020 laureates of the George W. Hunt S.J. Prize for Excellence in Journalism, Arts, and Letters in the category of journalism. Thank you, Father Lerner, for that uh, very generous introduction. America Media is proud to partner once again with St. Thomas More on this year's Hunt Prize. And I particularly appreciated the remarks about Father Bob, who was a dear friend and valued partner of America Media, who really believed in this project and did so much to realize it in his lifetime. Before introducing the prize, I would be remiss if I did not offer our thanks to the work of the selection committee, Dr. Angela Alema O'Donnell of Fordham University, Dr. Mara Ryan of the University of Notre Dame, Father Kevin Spinelli, who is the moderator of the Catholic Book Club here at America, and Dr. Kathy Caveney uh, of Boston College. The Hunt Prize, awarded annually by the trustees of St. Thomas More Chapel and Center at Yale University and the directors of America Media recognizes the finest work of the Roman Catholic literary imagination. The recipient's work demonstrates those literary qualities that Father Hunt, the longest serving editor-in-chief in America's history, those qualities that he valued the most, rigor, order, and discipline of thought, as well as honesty, sympathy, and optimism. The recipient's work, according to our charter, should also demonstrate originality, intelligence, imagination, elegance, and promise of further achievement. In addition to the monetary prize, Hunt Prize laureates deliver an original lecture that is published in America Magazine. And this year's prize, as you know, is awarded in the category of journalism. As one nominator of this year's laureate wrote, she is a brilliant, knowledgeable, and empathetic young reporter, and a writer on major religious themes in our politics and in our culture. In just a few years, she has become one of the most thoughtful and important journalists covering the intersection of faith and life, religion and politics. She is a first-rate reporter, not a commentator. She is a beautiful writer, lifting up the human dimensions of breaking news and broader religious themes. Another nominator wrote of our laureate, as a result of her smarts, her work ethic, her empathy, and her moxie, she now dominates her beat in a way that few reporters ever manage to do. She is especially adept at bringing exclusive highly original stories about faith in public life to a large audience of loyal readers. Winner of multiple first place prizes from the Religious 
Religion News Association. Her guest appearances include the, the New York Times, The Washington Post, NPR's All Things Considered, MSNBC, CNN, and The Brian Lehrer Show. She is a graduate of Georgetown University and serves as a staff writer for The Atlantic. For the excellence of her work, the recognition of her skill and devotion to her craft, it is my pleasure, along with the Thomas More Center and Chapel at Yale University, and on behalf of American Media, to award the George W. Hunt S.J. Prize for Excellence in Journalism, Arts, and Letters to Emma Green. I want to start by thanking the trustees of America Magazine and the St. Thomas More Chapel at Yale University. I am delighted and humbled by this prize and recognition of my work. It is such an honor, and in particular, it's an honor to have this recognition from these two institutions in the Catholic tradition and in the Jesuit tradition. I was a graduate of Georgetown University, and I often joke that I am a walking poster child for the Jesuit education because I actually use the contents of the seminar I took on Vatican II on a daily basis in my professional life. So it is really just an honor to, to be here and to be celebrating uh, this Catholic literary tradition and imagination that we've heard comments about today. I'm going to share comments now about a topic that's much heavier. Um, as a, a journalist of religion and politics, I find that today is, is a heavier time than perhaps uh, other periods in our history. I spent the early months of the coronavirus pandemic feeling desperately claustrophobic. I was quarantined in a one-bedroom apartment in New York City, and I would sometimes imagine that my fire escape was a creaky porch somewhere out in the woods as I would sit out in the early evenings and listen to my neighbors cheer and clap and bang on pots to celebrate the essential workers who were carrying the city on their backs. Life felt stuck. There was no way to plan, nowhere to go, nothing to build towards. The calendar had been emptied of weddings and dinners and reunions. The comforting rhythms of weeks and seasons disappeared. I found myself alternately plotting wild adventures and yearning for a quiet communal life. A professor of mine at Georgetown used to call this kind of musing Jesuit daydreaming, which was his description of the rich Ignatian tradition of spiritual discernment. I should pay attention to daydreams, he told me, because they can be more revealing than I might first assume. And in this case, I think he's right. My pandemic mind loop was tracing the problem that I've come to see as one of the greatest dilemmas of modern life. In my work as a religion journalist, I have come up with a mental image to explain the importance of the beat to secular colleagues and readers. While not everyone describes themselves as having faith or even being religious or spiritual, everyone has those searching moments in the middle of the night, the covers pulled up high to their chin, wondering how to have a good life. More often than not, people's descriptions of what a good life looks like depends on a single factor, the strength of the community around them. And as a reporter, it's my job to follow along with individuals and communities as they try and figure out how they want to live. Over the past six months, however, the path towards a good life has become obscured for many Americans. As I sat inside my apartment daydreaming about the future, dozens of my neighbors and people on my street were getting sick, losing family members, or navigating the anxiety of being immunocompromised during a public health crisis. Many Americans, especially in New York, have spent their last six months mostly alone, mostly at home, sometimes unable to even wave hello to a loved one. The unemployment rate in New York City is nearly 20%. Many beloved businesses will likely never come back after the shutdown. These basic ingredients of a good life, decent health, the warmth of family and friends, economic stability, are now out of reach for far more people than they were at the start of 2020. 
But the pandemic has also revealed the extent to which a good life felt elusive for countless Americans far before any of us had heard of COVID-19. This is not just a matter of money or resources. In my reporting, I constantly find evidence that Americans feel isolated and unmoored from their communities, unsure of their place in the world. I'm thinking of a black Southern Baptist trained pastor who couldn't stomach taking his kids to church in his denomination anymore because of the reticence of his fellow church members to talk about racism. I'm thinking of a longtime staffer at a major American archdiocese who feels daily rage at the Catholic Church's inability to address the clergy sexual abuse crisis. I'm thinking of a young woman fired from her job at a conservative Christian advocacy organization because she spoke out against President Donald Trump. I'm thinking of a Catholic professor who bitterly wishes the Democratic Party had room for pro-life views like his. These are all examples from the world of religion and politics, but they speak to a deep and expansive truth. In many parts of American life, people feel that the institutions that we're supposed to guard our lives and guide our lives have failed, and there's no space for people like them. The result, which I see in my reporting all the time, is a widespread sense of mutual mistrust. Last year, Pew Research Center found that fewer than one in five Americans say they can trust the government. Nearly two-thirds of Americans have a hard time telling truth from lies when elected officials speak. And even more believe the government unnecessarily withholds important information from the public. I've encountered plenty of mistrust in the course of doing my work reporting stories. People believe that they know my politics, they suspect me of bias, and they assume I will be hostile to religion because of where I work. Religious leaders may be the most mistrusted group of all. As one influential Catholic businessman in Boston told me a couple of years when I was reporting a story there following the sexual abuse scandal, I go to mass about two, three, four days a week. I'm not into Vatican politics. I'm not into Vatican museums. I'm not into people who wear red slippers and fancy robes. I bought into this as a kid because of the life of Christ, so I'm in, but I'm not drinking any Kool-Aid. In just the past few weeks, I've been reporting on the way that political and spiritual alienation plays out in Northeastern Pennsylvania, a historically Catholic area that will have huge significance in the upcoming 2020 election. The mayor of Scranton pointed out that people in that city and region were devastated by the 2018 grand jury report that detailed dozens of instances of child sexual abuse in their diocese. Taken together with the Penn State sexual abuse scandal and widespread corruption among public officials in the area, she said, local residents had effectively lost their government, their football team, and their church. Versions of this story are playing out across the country, leaving Americans feeling unsure of who they are and who they can trust. And we certainly don't trust one another. Our lives as Americans are increasingly sorted by partisan identity in ways that are frankly shocking. Researchers have found that Republicans and Democrats drive different kinds of cars, watch different kinds of television shows, and listen to different music. We tend to live next to neighbors who share our political beliefs and often pick our friends and communities based on shared convictions. Surveys show that a significant minority of Americans basically never encounter people with differing worldviews from their own and would be unhappy if their son or daughter were to marry someone from the opposite political party. This sense of tribalism is exacerbated by publical, political officials who intentionally sow division, seeking chaos and animosity as a political strength rather than a collective weakness. As President Donald Trump said at the Republican National Convention recently, ostensibly referring to Democrats or liberals or just people who don't support him, we're here and they're not. I'm offering this litany not as general doomsaying, but to paint a backdrop to show why it is that some Americans might feel unsure of how to build a good life at this distinctive moment in our history. In pandemic times, we spend our days literally isolating from one another, shut away and alone. In spirit and identity, however, Americans were already isolated, feeling sold out by their leaders and dissatisfied with the implicit contract of American life. My Jesuit professors didn't just teach me to daydream. They hammered home how important it is to be a man or a woman for others, that this is the point of education and a simple guideline for how to live out life. 
In my travels through American communities, the most joyful and peaceful people I've met are doing just that. Their lives are entwined in the lives of others, and they happily embrace their obligations to their community. But as a broader culture, I think we've lost our knack for building this kind of civic utopia. It's hard to be a man or woman for others in a culture that's dominated by us versus them. As a journalist, I see it as my job to be a kind of guide, or maybe the better term is map maker. I plot landmark moments and trace the direction of currents, showing readers places and people they otherwise wouldn't encounter. I think the widespread sense of mutual suspicion and isolation in our country is the most urgent big picture story of religion and politics right now. In my reporting, I see two major kinds of reactions to this cultural frustration. One is an attempt to overhaul America, and the other is an attempt to build something new. Much of what I cover in the world of religion and politics falls into the realm of what we might call culture wars, efforts to win over people to a certain mindset, to shape our politics, to share a specific vision of the good life. I routinely interview political organizers, writers, legal advocates, and politically active clergy from the left and from the right who describe an existential battle for the soul of our nation, to borrow a phrase from Joe Biden. When I speak to pro-life pro activists who have dedicated their lives to ending abortion, they describe the presidential election and the Supreme Court appointments that will likely follow as generation-defining events. They are horrified by the rhetoric and convictions of their opponents, and they speak of abortion in the language of evil. Or you can take the progressive black pastors who have staged protests at state capitals across the South over a lack of access to health care and cuts to social safety net programs. They call these life or death policy decisions that define who we are as a nation. One such set of protests led by the Reverend William Barber in North Carolina was explicitly framed as a fight over morality in public life. In the view of these activists, there is no morally or biblically sound argument for government policies that leave poor and working class Americans struggling to make it. Perhaps most powerfully, the massive protests we've seen unfolding across America this summer are a cry to change the status quo of racism and police violence towards black people in this country. I've watched as religious group after religious group grapples with its own role in promoting racism in this country, its own history of bigotry. And at times, these religious leaders have decided to participate in those marches and protests. In just the last few weeks, I met an octogenarian sister of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in Scranton, who described to me the backlash that they saw at Marywood University uh, in Scranton, which the sisters oversee, to a giant Black Lives Matter poster that went up on campus. She was convinced that there is no question whatsoever where the sisters should be standing, and that's on the side of the movement for racial equality. These struggles over what it means to be American, our greatest sins, the lives we value, our political ideals, are critically important. To many, the fights that we're seeing play out every day on the news today are a matter of survival. They may be exhausting, and for good reasons, they may exacerbate American sense that there are people on their side who fight for the right things and people on the other side who fight for the wrong things. But they say these fights are necessary. And yet, I can't seem to shake my sneaking suspicion that these big debates, which I spend my days covering day in and day out, these big debates over who we are as a nation of 330 million people don't actually get us very far in our search for a good life. So much of America's cultural attention on social media, in the news, in pop culture is directed towards this grand, almost unfathomable scale. I'm personally responsible for helping create the sense that life only matters at the national level, and so are my colleagues at large in the media. We report on trends sweeping the nation, the latest drama surrounding the president, the hashtags trending on Facebook and Twitter. Two things have to be true at once. These national political debates matter, and they may actively make it harder to be a human with a sense of fellowship, personal direction, meaningful life, and community. This is why I have been interested in recent years in a sort of countercultural movement that seems to be blooming right now in America. People are seeking to build vibrant alternatives to the main street. Visions of the good life that are idealistic, 
intense, and built around the mutual dependencies that are only possible in small communities. The people I'm interested in have often gone through some sort of personal awakening. Perhaps they discover faith or become dissatisfied with the nine to five monotony of workaday life. They are religious converts, hardcore environmentalists, skeptics of consumer capitalism, and they are willing to radically alter the way that they live in search of the good life. There are small networks of black schools, community gardens, and food distribution centers that fashion themselves after the work of Marcus Garvey, the 19th century thinker and activist who argued that freedom for black people can only be won through self-reliance and independence from white-dominated institutions. Or to consider something radically different, there's St. Mary's, Kansas, a little Catholic town that I reported on a year ago that's almost exactly in the center of the country, where parishioners of the Society of St. Pius X, which is considered canonically irregular by the Vatican, have built a community where they can worship, play work, and teach their children uh, surrounded by other people who share their theological convictions. The priests celebrate Mass in Latin, the families have tons of babies, and the life cycle of the town runs on a Catholic liturgical calendar. Vibrant, largely young communities like St. Mary's, whose members see themselves as stewards of the faith and stewards of tradition against liberalization and secularization in American society, have been the subject of much discussion in elite conservative circles. An unexpected breakout theater hit in 2019, Heroes of the First Turning, centered on a fictional Catholic college in Wyoming whose students and faculty had created a mini utopia of conservative values. Notably, Rod Dreher chronicled these kinds of communities in his 2017 book, The Benedict Option, in which he called on Christians to gird themselves for a long period of cultural marginalization. Dreher imagines and observes people building their own schools, developing rich prayer practices, and above all, insulating themselves from the toxic influences of secular American culture. Much of his book focuses on the expansion of LGBTQ rights and acceptance in America, purporting to show why conservatives should anticipate cultural rejection in the years to come. In Dreher's telling, at least, one motivation for opting out of American culture and American culture wars is fear. He is convinced that mainstream America no longer celebrates or perhaps even tolerates people who share his beliefs. I think this exclusive focus on conservative retrenchment misses the richness of this countercultural movement that I've been following. American life is not possible, it does not work, for so many people. It is either unattainable, unaffordable, or uninspiring. The choices to live differently don't have to be motivated by terror or anxiety. They can also be driven by a search for broader horizons. American history is littered with examples of utopian projects built out of religious zeal or an idealistic vision for the common good. Members of the mid-19th century of the Oneida community in upstate New York believed Jesus had already returned and sinlessness is possible in this life, and they built their community around those principles. A little closer to the mainstream, Dorothy Day and Peter Marin founded the Catholic Worker Houses out of a desire to model Catholic social teachings, living in community, forfeiting personal wealth, offering hospitality to the poor. People in these communities believe that to live well, you have to give up nearly everything your privacy, your claim to personal property, your assumptions about the structure of life. They had a vision for what was true and righteous, and they were willing to radically transform their lives in order to obtain it. Perhaps if people were left alone to build their ideal little communities, there would be less fodder for America's culture wars. No side would need to defeat the other in the battle for the soul of America. We could each define the soul of America as we wished. And yet, the challenge is doing this without losing a kind of civic vocabulary, an ability to empathically imagine the life and perspective of your neighbor. No matter how much we may fantasize about a world perfectly crafted to reflect our beliefs, where we feel like we can trust our government, trust our neighbors, trust our media, and trust each other, surrounded only by people who share our taste and convictions, the truth is that America only works if starkly different people are willing to vote at the same precincts, respect each other's rights and traditions, and remain civil at city council meetings. We are caught between the demands of nationhood that lock us into a dangerous cycle of conflict and the, smart, and the search for a small, good life that may tempt us to neglect our duties to engage as citizens. We are living through a period of crisis in American life where it is no longer obvious that Americans share a sense of stewardship over our democracy. Our disunity is evident in the biggest news stories of the day. Consider crowds of protests 
facing off against police night after night in cities listed off like war zones. Portland, Kenosha, Minneapolis. Culture war fights bloom over the smallest impositions on our daily lives, like wearing a mask to diminish the spread of COVID-19. And our collective anger over politics has spiked dangerously. While polling is a rough and unrefined tool for understanding how Americans think and feel, the numbers are really striking. A New York Times survey from earlier this summer found that voters are mostly feeling scared, anxious, and exhausted about the state of affairs in our country. An August CNN poll found that nearly 80% of Americans say they're angry about how things are going in this country, and more than half of those say that they are very angry. Previous CNN surveys ask, asking the same question have never found levels of American anger to be nearly that high. It will be months and years even before we fully understand the way that American communal life has been affected by COVID-19. No in-person gatherings for months on end. Donations drying up as families struggle with unemployment or salary cuts in this economic drought. People moving away from cities in an attempt to find more affordable housing or to care for sick parents and siblings. The biggest mega churches and the richest organizations will be fine. It's the fledgling communities that will founder the experiments in the good life. The small churches with bivocational pastors, the vibrant grassroots groups that don't own a building or have much by way of savings, the communities of women religious whose members and numbers have been ravaged by the virus. Zoom is no replacement for praying together in person, hands held as voices rise together in hymns. New babies deserve to be fed with communal meal trains and passed from person to person in the back of a social hall. Morning demands long hours of sitting together in quiet, a parade of neighbors showing up with aluminum trays of rose water treats. This quotidian form of togetherness is not to be taken for granted. It is constitutive of the good life. It is one more painful thing to lose in our pandemic times. This year will be remembered for many things, COVID, mass protests, the election yet to come. But the theme lingering behind it all will be this communal breaking, the further fracturing of an already isolated American landscape. Community seems like a long lost indulgence. Any kind of collective gathering feels like a precious treat that might be taken away at any moment. Pain, struggle, and anxiety are the language of this year. When I ask my neighbors how they're doing, they mostly say, hanging in there. It's a strange time to be thinking about radical new forms of community to be questioning our assumptions about how we need to live in order to live well. But maybe that's a small gift in an otherwise lost year. Perhaps pandemic times will give us the freedom to question everything and to commence new experiments in living. Thank you. Thank you.